Hello, everybody, and welcome again. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Aaron Rosenblum. I'm the Health and Science Librarian at the Portland Public Library. Uh, I'll be here with you this evening. Uh, tonight's event is part of our monthly or mostly monthly sustainability series, uh, which we are thrilled to host along with the Southern Maine Conservation Collaborative. This is our fifth season of collaborating on the sustainability series, and we're just really happy uh, to continue to be part of this partnership. Uh, we hope you'll join us for our next program, which is on March 24th, a month from today at 5.30 p.m. And we will be hearing from Window Dressers, a volunteer-based organization that builds low-cost insulating window inserts for Maine residents of all income levels. I'd now like to turn it over to Jessica Burton, who is the Executive Director of the Southern Maine Conservation Collaborative, who will introduce tonight's program. Thanks, Aaron. Um, great to be here tonight. The Southern Maine Conservation Collaborative is a network of land and water conservation organizations that work together for bigger impact. And one of the ways we do that is seek opportunities for strategic partnerships with other initiatives and organizations. And our partnership with the Portland Public Library is a great example of that. It really provides a platform for all sorts of speakers touching on conservation, climate, the environment um, to reach people now on Zoom from all over. We have people joining from maybe not this month, but other months we've had people joining from multiple states. So that's, that's super cool. One of the cool things about Zoom. But we're, um, we're really excited tonight. The Portland Water District is one of the members of the Southern Maine Conservation Collaborative. They joined because they are deeply committed to conservation in the watershed. And uh, they've been a really active participant in our conversations, in our development, and in our strategy. And uh, Paul has been a speaker in this series twice before over the last five, six years. So I'm really excited to welcome him back. So Paul is the environmental manager for the Portland Water District. His group of employees is responsible for lake protection and security, environmental education and outreach, water security, industrial pretreatment, and operating two water and wastewater laboratories. Like all of us, Paul is part of the larger water management system in Greater Portland. He and his wife live in Cape Elizabeth in a house that is provided with tap water from Sebago Lake, and from which wastewater is discharged through a comprehensive water treatment system to Casco Bay. So I, uh, I'm thrilled to, to introduce Paul um, and excited for this talk tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jess. I'm going to share my screen so that you can um, look at something other than me. Really happy to be here tonight. Let me, let me get it in the right form. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here to talk about, I would say it's my favorite topic, but um, maybe the Red Sox and Bob Dylan are in the running for that, uh, that title, but it is one of my favorite topics. Um, I entitled it Water World. I chose the title of a Kevin Costner movie that was panned by the critics. I, uh, I oddly liked the movie, um, sort of a dystopian uh, future view of the world. Um, I like movies that are dystopian. I don't like living in a dystopian world as we have for the last year, but I like movies about it. So I chose that for my title. Uh, the subtitle, uh, I'm gonna break down in more detail in a later slide. So I'm just gonna skip ahead. Here's my title. Um, as Jess said, I'm the environmental manager with the uh, Portland Water District. And I've been in that role for over 20 years. The, be the best job I've ever had. I, and I don't just say that because my boss is probably listening. It really is a great company. When you have a, a shared mission that everybody in the company ag you know, agrees with and believes in, it makes all the difference in the world. And I'm really proud to work there. Um, uh, that's my email address. Uh, I'm doing that. And I'm going to give it to you again at the end because I am not the expert probably in any of the things I'm gonna talk about tonight. I know a little bit about a lot. I would say that's a characteristic of me, but I work with all the smart kids. And so if you have a question that I can't answer and you email it to me, then I can probably get it to the person who can and I can get you an answer. Um, so I, again, I will repeat that again at the end. So this is the title of my, the subtitle of my talk, Natural and Built Infrastructure for Treating and Managing Water. Um, and I wanna sort of 
break it apart. I used to be a high school science teacher, and I found in teaching science that often it was the jargon that was stood between the students and understanding what I was talking about. And we use a lot of jargon in, in the water world. And so I'm going to try to, I'm going to use jargon, but I'm going to try to define it as I go so that it'll make sense to you. And um, so I'm going to define what I mean by built infrastructure. I'm going to define what I mean by natural infrastructure. And I want to also pick apart this phrase managing water a little bit. Um, so let's start with built infrastructure. What do I mean by built infrastructure? That's probably the easiest of these terms to talk about. Here it is. So built infrastructure is what you think it is. It's the, the pipes, the concrete, the structures, the pump stations, the things that we build in the water world to move water from one place to another, to treat it, to hold it back. We, we build a lot of things. Mostly it's buried and you can't see it or it's in a sort of a nondescript concrete building that looks like it's not much of anything, but there's a lot of things built inside there to, to do the work that we do. This picture happens to be the 19, a, a main being installed in 1912, so more than a century ago. Um, it's a 42 inch cast iron main. It's a transmission main. A transmission main just means the trunk of the tree. We have transmission mains, which is the largest pipes, and then they branch out into distribution mains. So this is one of the largest pipes in our system. We call it the 42 for obvious reasons. Uh, we're very fond of the 42. You're still drinking out of it today. It has been in the ground for over 100 years, and it's still providing water service to Greater Portland. The, the, I think this picture was taken in Westbrook when the main was being installed from Sebago Lake into Portland, but it's still in use today. Um, and here's another example of built infrastructure. This is um, the East End Wastewater Treatment Facility. It's an activated sludge facility. Um, I'm certainly, I'm not even a novice in how to operate such a thing. I go there periodically because one of our laboratories is there, but there's other people that, that operate this plant. It's Maine's largest wastewater treatment facility. It's on the side of Munjoy Hill. When you come over Tukey's Bridge, if you look to the left, you've probably seen it there. Um, a lot goes on at this plant, and I'll just tell you that um, as wastewater moves through this plant, first grit is removed, which is the sand coming off the streets. That gets removed first. Then there's some primary settling that goes on to drop out some of the heavy stuff and float some of the oil and grease. Then we aerate the water to add, add oxygen so that bacteria can do its thing and break down the waste. Clarification happens after that where the, the solids settle out, then it's disinfected before being discharged into Casco Bay. That's a typical, it's, it's not unlike many other wastewater treatment plants in Maine, it just happens to be the largest one. Um, here's another example of built infrastructure. Um, these are two um, 9 million gallon water storage reservoirs. Um, they're in Westbrook on Rocky Hill in Westbrook. So we like to refer to them as the Rockies, Rocky Senior and Rocky Junior. They were both built in the 1990s. Um, each one holds 9 million gallons. So what you're looking at, that one, of course, Rocky Junior is still under construction there. They're both in operation now. And when they're full, they hold 18 million gallons of water. And that happens to be about one day's supply we use, I say we, now when you hear me say we, sometimes I probably am referring to we, the Portland Water District, but mostly I mean the community because we are a quasi-municipal nonprofit. We are essentially doing your work for you. We, we operate the systems we do based on what our customers say they want through the process of we have a board of elected board of officials. And so it's a public, uh, our budgets are transparent. Everything is done sort of for us. So when I say we, in this case, I mean all of us, including me and you, we use 22 million gallons of water per day on average. And what you're looking at there is two reservoirs that can hold nine, uh, 18 million. So it's about one day's worth of water. So now I'm going to talk about natural infrastructure. What do I mean by natural infrastructure? This is natural infrastructure. Before we ever came along, there was water, and water was moved from place to place by the earth. It was treated by the earth um, through what we like to refer to as natural infrastructure, the woods. I mean, that's how water is naturally treated, slowed down, infiltrated into the ground. It happens in forests and other vegetated areas. And 
one of the things I want to talk about tonight is how our system today is a combination of natural infrastructure and built infrastructure, and they work in concert. This is another example of natural infrastructure. This happens to be a picture taken in Kapisic Park in Portland um, by Portland Trails, but this is a, you know, a vegetated area, wooded area in the city, and it is actually doing some of the work of our whole global or regional water system for us. And it's an important part of the natural infrastructure that makes up the water system that we where we live. Um, okay, this idea of managing water, I just want to debunk it a little bit. It's a little bit like the term raising children. We like to say, you know, I have three children. We raise children. We really don't. Children raise themselves. If we did nothing, they would grow up and they would become adults. Now, what we do is we, inf we try to influence them. We hope we feed them. We clothe them. We make sure they have a roof over their heads. We hope that they, we help bring them to adulthood so that they're healthy and educated and well-adjusted and all of that. But kids raise themselves. Well, similarly, water manages itself. It's going to do what it's going to do. What we do is we intercept it along its journey of managing itself and we borrow it for a time and then we give it back. And um, so we, you know, we, I just don't want to overplay. We're not in charge of the whole thing. Earth is in charge of the water and we're using that as part of, uh, because we need to, to live. So I'm going to um, draw you some cartoons tonight to try to show you how the system works that, that, um, supports all of us here in Greater Portland. Um, so let's just talk about this idea of managing water just in general. So just imagine you're looking at a landscape from the side, so it's high to the left and low to the right. Um, and we'll put the ocean over there on the right at the lowest point. And we'll put a lake in the middle kind of at this break in the slope. So there's a lake. Um, and we'll put some natural infrastructure, right? So we'll put more trees on the upslope side, and we'll put fewer trees on the downslope side, but there's natural infrastructure in both places. And now just imagine it starts raining. So this is the way water man is managed by the earth. So it rains um, and the water flows downhill, of course. And so it flows over land, represented by those arrows, but it also is conveyed in rivers and streams and is cha you know, it channelizes, and but it's all flowing in one direction, downhill toward the ocean. The water fills the lake, the lake overflows and has an outlet stream or river, and it flows down to the ocean. It also, of course, it's raining everywhere, so you also have an overland flow in the, the part of the slope that's below the lake. So again, this is just sort of the water cycle that we all um, saw when we were in school. Well, of course, water evaporates from the ocean. I don't know, you can't probably see that arrow. I don't know if your screen is covered by these faces too, but there's an arrow under there showing evaporation from the ocean, clouds forming, the clouds move um, over land again, it rains again. You've seen this before, right? The water cycle. So Earth is managing the water and we're just sort of interceding in the whole thing. So, so now let's get a little closer to home and let's talk about our system, okay? So here's an aerial image showing you Portland, um, the Portland area, Sebago Lake, of course, right in the center of the picture. Um, you can see the area north and west of Sebago Lake is known as the Lakes region, and you can see why. You can see all those lakes there. Um, Casco Bay down to the lower right. Um, so what's this red blob that's drawn on this particular aerial image? Well, that is our water service area. So what you're seeing in that image is um, a thousand miles of water pipe. You saw the, the 42 being put in in 1912, but we put in new water main every year and we replace some of the old. And so there's this amalgam of a thousand miles of pipe. Some of it's a hundred years old, some of it's one year old, all pieced together of different vintages and, and types and diameters. But that's how water is conveyed from Sebago Lake to all of your homes and businesses. So that's one part of the water system that we uh, where we live but there's another part and so and it's represented by that area it, it exists in that area um surrounded in yellow uh, that i outlined in yellow that's that's all the land area north of the lake mostly you can see that flows to sebago lake so if it rains anywhere within that yellow line that water will eventually make its way to sebago lake um, so that's what's known as the watershed. When you hear that term watershed, it's thrown around a lot. That just means all the land area that flows to a particular water body. So this is the watershed of Sebago Lake that you can see. 
How does it do that? Well, it flows through a whole, ser a whole network of rivers and streams and lakes, all of which eventually carry that water down to Sebago Lake, as well as, of course, water flowing overland as well. So that's what, so now there's two water systems here that I'm showing you that work together. There's a one in blue, which is the watershed a water system, and then there's one in red, which is our drinking water infrastructure. Uh, the belly button that connects these two water systems together is the water treatment plant. So you have nature kind of bringing all that water to the lake. It's withdrawn at the water treatment plant, treated, and then it goes in through those that thousand miles of pipe to your homes. So that's in in short, that's how the system is arranged. Um, remember, though, this is one of the key take home messages that I want you to get from this talk, and that is that both the blue system and the red system, both those areas have some natural infrastructure and some built infrastructure. So even up in the watershed, there are towns there, there are people living there. So there are culverts and there are bridges going over. And so there's built infrastructure, but there's a lot more natural infrastructure up there. Mostly the water is flowing through natural systems. Down here, it's more built infrastructure, but there's also natural infrastructure like that picture you saw at Kapisic Park. So in both cases, it's an amalgam of um, natural and built systems working together. Um, okay, so I'm going to do something that's going to be a little unsettling next, and that is I'm going to rotate this whole thing on its side. And I'll explain to you why I'm doing that later, but it's going to look really funny because we're so used to maps, north is up, south is down, but I'm going to rotate it 90 degrees like this. It would really make my life easier if this was the way the, the earth was arranged because the screen is long and skinny, but the watershed is is tall. But anyway, here it is. Here's the system laying on its side. And I'll show you, you'll see why I'm doing that in a second. I'm just going to now overlay the cartoon I drew earlier. Um, so here's the water, the water, you know, so essentially now I'm going to remove the picture and show you that I was drawing a cartoon that represents our system. So you have the watershed sort of on, on the west or the, uh, the left. Um, Sebago Lake in the center, the water service area, and then Casco Bay. Um, I'll throw some houses in there to kind of complete the picture. So you have fewer houses in the watershed. It's that's rural Maine. And then here's er more urban Maine. And so there's more houses, more buildings. But essentially, it's built on this natural infrastructure. Um, when it rains, water flows overland through all of this. And it also flows through those rivers and streams. I'm just going to remove some of that just to make room so I can draw a few more things. Um, so eventually we removed some trees right there. I'm going to show you that again so you can see what I just did right there next to the lake. So if, that's where we built the treatment plant. So that's where you'll find the Sebago Lake water treatment facility right there, the belly button. And from there, you know, there's a whole series of pipes. So there's our thousand miles of pipe represented by those, the transmission mains in the bigger one, and then the smaller ones, the branches of the tree. We have some water storage tanks like the Rockies. We have 10 of those or so um, scattered throughout the system at strategic places. And that's the reason we have those tanks is that when you all wake up in the morning and you all want water at the same time, you can't get it through all those mains fast enough to every house. So if it was all sitting in the lake when we woke up in the morning, we couldn't get it to you in time. So instead we have these reservoirs and storage tanks full of water so that while you're asleep, we fill them up. And then when you all wake up in the morning and turn on your water, it drains out of those tanks, which then we can fill up when you're at work. Um, so it's hard to see uh, on my screen anyway, but down here, I'm now I'm just showing you the sewer mains that we have also been constructed over the last century and a half or so to take this water after we're done with it and move it away from our houses um, right into Casco Bay. And I part of the story is until about 40 or so years ago, 40 or 50 years ago, all the wastewater from our homes and businesses was conveyed through sewer pipes directly to Casco Bay and Back Cove. There was no treatment. Um, so that's what the system was. But since that time, of course, um, I'm now going to draw the East End Treatment Facility represented by this red square. Now we intercept that water and treat it before it goes into Casco Bay. So now there's our whole system, kind of the natural and the built system together. So. Here are the take home messages from that first part of my talk. 
nature has always used natural infrastructure to treat and manage water. It did it before we were here. If we all went away, like in a dystopian future, the earth would still manage the water. So we're not managing the water. We're just participating in the management of water. We use built infrastructure so that we can borrow, use, and then return the water. And by the way, part of what I'm going to talk about in this talk is what the benefits are of natural infrastructure. And I'll talk about some of those. But don't take that to mean we, sh we should just have only natural infrastructure. You can't have 7 billion people on Earth and not have built systems to move water where it's needed, um, when we need it, and to make sure that it's clean. But when we can use natural infrastructure and keep it in place, there's benefits to that, which I will talk about. Our drinking water and wastewater systems are a combination of natural and built systems. They always have been. They always will be. Built infrastructure is expensive, it requires maintenance, and it wears out. And so, for example, our treatment facility, uh, our drinking water treatment facility was built first in 1993, the more, most recent one. And 20 years later, we had to kind of take out some of the systems that had worn out, just like in your house, you have to replace appliances and re replace them. So built infrastructure wears out and has to be replaced. So it's a, con it's a cost that we never get away completely from. Natural infrastructure, by contrast, is beautiful. And not to say that concrete, big concrete buildings are not beautiful in their own way, but natural infrastructure is beautiful and it lasts, in theory, forever. It doesn't have to be replaced. If you, if you manage the forests in a sustainable way, they will grow back on their own and we don't have to do that for them. Um, and you can hike on natural infrastructure. And that's, I'm going to talk a little bit more later on about the water system, and, and I will talk about that more. So I'm going to skip ahead now and move into the next part of my talk, where I want to talk a little bit about the um, two major organizations that are involved in, for people in the city of Portland in particular, in managing the water and wastewater. And it's the Portland Water District and the city of Portland. And and sometimes people think that we're the same. Like they'll hear that I work for the Portland Water District and in their head, they think city of Portland. It turns out we're two different organizations. We are related, you know, we're, we're, we're related in that we hold hands, we share responsibilities for things, we work together, we are partners and we could not do what we do without the city of Portland and they couldn't do what they do without us, but we're not the same organization. The city has, um, a city council, uh, elected officials. We have a board of trustees, elected officials. A water district is is kind of like a school district in that, you know, you you create an organization and say we want you to handle all the decision making around schools so that we can focus on everything else. And similarly, you do that with a water and a wastewater utility. You create a district and you say you guys deal with that stuff, and that way we don't have to. So. We manage all the drinking water infrastructure, the Portland Water District does, and we manage some of the sewer infrastructure, but not all of it and not even most of it in some cases. Um, and we, we also built and we maintain and operate the water treatment facility at Sebago Lake and four wastewater treatment plants, including the East End one, which I showed you a picture of already. So the key thing that I want you to get from this slide is that we are very we have a much easier job in many ways in most ways than the city does because we only have to deal with one thing all of our infrastructure is water and sewer related so we're like laser focused on one thing our colleagues at the city they're not they don't manage the drinking water infrastructure but they manage a lot of the sewer and stormwater infrastructure but remember, they also have lots of other infrastructure that they are responsible for, roads, bridges, schools. They're responsible for civic centers and all kinds of things that we are fortunate. We can just not pay attention to that stuff and focus on one thing, which is what the partnership is about. We're responsible for one thing that benefits the city, but the city and that allows the city to focus on all the other things. So now I'm going to just in another way, tell you that same story, but I'm going to give you some pie charts so that maybe this will stick in your head after the talk is over a little bit better. What is the Portland Water District responsible for? What is the city of Portland responsible for? We are responsible for the entire drinking water system from soup to nuts, um, treatment, storage, and distribution. Okay, so now here I've just introduced a brand new term, sanitary wastewater. It's probably the silliest term that we have because it's the most unsanitary thing in the whole system. Sanitary wastewater is what 
goes, what comes out of your home when you flush the toilet, when you spit in the sink, when you wash your dishes, when you wash your clothes, we call that sanitary wastewater, which really should be called unsanitary wastewater. But anyway, the part that that system is partly managed by the city, the collection system, which is all the mains that carry the, the sanitary wastewater from homes and businesses to the treatment plant. The treatment plant is managed by the district and also Here's another new term, interceptors are built and managed largely by the district. And I'm gonna show you those, so I'm not gonna spend any more time here talking about them. There's also stormwater. When it rains, you know, the streets fill with stormwater and that has to be managed. That is mostly the responsibility of the city, um, but the district has some responsibilities. I'm gonna uh, introduce another new term, which I will also define and show you pictures of, combined sewer overflows. So I'm gonna talk about those more. So just know that the district manages a bunch of them. The city also manages a bunch of them and also retention structures. And I'm gonna talk more about retention structures because if, the la if you've driven down 295 recently, you can see a big construction project going on. The city is building this enormous retention structure and I'm gonna describe for you what that does and why it's important. So one of the challenges that we face in Portland and that people face in many in most cities is that we don't have two separate systems for dealing with stormwater and sanitary wastewater. We have one system. It's called a combined sewer system. Very common, particularly in older cities, because you you know these things are built kind of iteratively over time and you start by building some sewer pipes and then you realize wow our streets are filled with water so you build a storm drain and you connect it into the same system so i'm now going to draw you a little cartoon to show you how the combined system works so just imagine now you're looking at the peninsula and you're looking at it from south looking north so you know the top of the peninsula congress street is up here and you're looking down here's four river casco bay over here so we have homes and businesses up here on the top on, all over the peninsula and roads as well so here's a car um, when wa sanitary wastewater is comes out of our homes and businesses it's conveyed through collector a collection system and as I told you, for decades, um, it was conveyed directly to the ocean. So when you spit in the sink in a business or a home in greater Portland until the 1970s, it went directly to Casco Bay. But we also have these storms. You, you, when we build roads, we build stormwater collection uh, basins and things to get the water off the streets. And that water is piped into the same system. And as I said, this is quite a common thing. It's In retrospect, it would be nice if they were in two separate systems so you could treat them differently because sanitary wastewater and stormwater have different characteristics. But that's not what we have. We have a combined system. So that's why I'm representing that with pink because it's white and red, right? The two types of water co-mingled and conveyed directly to the ocean until the last 40 years. So there are these things called outfalls. And all that is, is just places where these collection sewers were outleted, daylighted to the ocean. Cause that was the strategy was get the storm, get the sewer water or get the sanitary wastewater out of these homes and businesses, get the storm water off the street and get it to the ocean. Um, this is what outfalls look like. This picture was taken in the 1970s around Back Cove where there are a whole lot of these outfalls. And I'll show you a picture of what that looks like. But these outfalls until the 1970s were untreated sanitary and storm water mixed together conveyed directly into Back Cove and or into Casco Bay. And what that meant was at low tide, especially Back Cove was essentially a big septic system. And so when it, you know, emptied out, when the tide went out, it smelled horrible and it was very unsanitary, very, I mean, you wouldn't probably swim there now either, but you definitely wouldn't swim there in the 70s. Um, it was in the 70s, this picture was taken in 1976, when it was decided by the city and others, it's time to build a, a treatment facility and treat this wastewater before it goes into the ocean. So this is a picture of a bunch of nerdy engineers. And I say that with all great respect, I work with engineers. They're all smarter than me. They can do math that I could never do, but I tease them a lot. So I'm just going to say these guys look like nerdy engineers to me. And they are breaking ground at the East End um, to build the, the um, treatment plant that you see there today. And you can even see here's an artist's rendering of what it's going to look like. That 
painting still hangs in our office. By the way, this site where the East End treatment plant is was a landfill before it was a treatment plant. So first the trash had to be removed and then the plant built on that site. Um, this is a picture taken about a year later. Uh, this is built in, this is what built infrastructure is all about. You have to dig big holes, you have to put a bunch of rebar down, you got to build these forms, pour all this concrete. It's incredibly expensive and it takes, it, this was one of the biggest construction projects in Maine history when this East End plant was built and all the connections to it, which I'll show you a little bit more about. So this is, you can see BNM Baked Beans is over here and this railroad bridge is still there. Um, this is again, the East End treatment plant under construction. This is a grainy picture, but I wanted to show you to, so you can appreciate that when you run past that place on the, on the trail there, most of what's going on there, you can't see. It's buried underground in all these vaults and passageways. There's piping, there's pumps, there's millions of dollars of infrastructure under there because we're moving millions of gallons of water per day through there and treating it. Uh, you can see Tukey's Bridge over here, b and Baked Beans, just to get you oriented. All right, so that was built in the late 70s, and uh, many tre wastewater treatment plants were built around the country around that same time. But that wasn't even the most impressive part of the built infrastructure that went in in the late 70s, in my opinion. It was the interceptor system. What is an interceptor? So I'm going back to our cartoon. And you remember, this is an outfall here where all the water is conveyed and empties into the ocean. An interceptor is a great big sewer main that intercepts all of these pipes that are carrying wastewater to the ocean, intercepts it, and carries them to be treated. So here's what a big vault as part of our, this is around Baxter Boulevard. I think this is around, maybe around Ocean Avenue. Um, but you can see this is a sewer main, a collector main coming down this way and emptying into this big vault. This is one of the biggest pieces of pipe in greater Portland. I think this is more than 80 inches in diameter. So that's like, I don't know how many feet that is. That's seven feet tall or eight feet tall, something close to that anyway. Um, so this, well, all this is doing is this water used to go straight into Back Cove, but now it goes here and it's intercepted and is carried by the interceptor system to be treated. So it's a, mitigating that untreated polluted water that used to go right into Back Cove. And um, that carries it now to the treatment plant. So this image, um, it shows you all the interceptor sewers that were constructed, like I say, in the late 70s into the, probably into the early 80s. Over here around, this is the Four River part of the system over here. Uh, commercial Street. Now, just, Jess, I know you work on Commercial Street. I want you to just think about what it would have been like in the 1970s. Some of the places, this is 60 feet down that you, you're building this underground infrastructure the old port was open at the time. And so just imagine all the traffic rooting around this as this was being constructed while the city was functioning. And then the last part of the system that you can see there is all around Back Cove. So there's a, an interceptor that goes all the way around there um, to intercept wastewater that used to flow directly into Back Cove. This is just zooming in on the Back Cove section because I'm going to draw a picture later that is going to kind of look like this. But so here you have the collector sewers carrying all this wastewater from all these homes down all these side streets, used to go right into Back Cove. Now it's intercepted by these much deeper, larger mains. So the way it kind of works, think of it like this. Interceptors are carrying wastewater down like this, around, coming around Back Cove, all carrying it to the East End treatment facility there. So this is so that we no longer have untreated wastewater going directly into the ocean and into Back Cove. This is an engineering miracle, in my opinion. You know, I, I, I can't even imagine how someone conceived of this, never mind then designing and building it. And it's still functioning, of course, today. Um, okay, so I'm going to skip to the next topic, which is a combined sewer overflow. So you, you, we, I just described this system and it seems like, well, aren't we done now? Like it's solved, right? We had these sewers going straight into the ocean spent a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of engineering to build this interceptor system and a treatment plant. Aren't we done? Well, the challenge with that is this combined system, right? Because under normal circumstances, you spit into your sink, you run your laundry, all that waste, sanitary wastewater moves through the system just as I described. But then it starts raining. And when it starts raining, we're getting a lot more water. We can get flow at the East End plant that goes from 
10 million gallons a day to 100 million gallons a day in like one day's time. So our system can handle that 10, can handle 20 million gallons a day, fine. But then when it starts raining and the whole system fills up, it can't carry that much water. And so there have to be pressure relief valves built into the system or the whole system would just explode when all that water rushed into it. And these pressure relief valves are known as combined sewer overflows or CSOs. And you're seeing one here. You're standing with your back to the ocean and you're looking into the sewer system. And this bricked weir here is just holding wastewater on that side so it can move through the interceptors and go to the treatment plant. But when more water comes in, it finally fills all the way up and it spills over the weir, then it gets it can goes right to the ocean again untreated. So these CSOs are places where necessarily we have to have these pressure relief valves, which means when they overflow, that's untreated wastewater again going to the ocean. And um, this happens, uh, these combined sewer overflow. Oh, so this is just the cartoon I told you I would draw for you. So here's the inner, uh, the co collector sewers from left to right, those three sewer mains coming in. The bigger one is the interceptor. Um, when they're no under normal circumstances, they're filled with, you know, they're part filled with water, but it can handle it all. But when it really starts raining, they get completely filled and then water has to overflow somewhere. So there are these pressure relief valves called CSOs kind of all around the system so it doesn't blow up. And these dots, each one of those represents a CSO structure. Some of them are owned and managed by the city, some of them owned and managed by the district. Um, and they, I, I asked Dennis Welch, who works in our, um, in our wastewater department, who built, who created this map for me, and he said they overflow about 40 times a year. So a little more, a little less than once a week. And it's all weather dependent. If it doesn't, we don't get a lot of rain, then they don't overflow. But as you know, when we get a rainstorm, then we get overflows. And our goal, of course, the cities and ours is to reduce the number of overflows. We, you know, if we could reduce that number, that's a good thing, right? Um, but it's all weather dependent. We can't control the weather. Um, you can find, if you want to know where these things are, they're scattered all around the city. So the next time you're on the walking path, look for one of these signs and it's just identifying for you this is a wet weather discharge site. Each one of them is licensed. There's monitoring equipment in them so that we can know when they are overflowing and how many gallons so that we can work on reducing that number. Um, so now I'm gonna, the last thing I'm gonna talk about in the wastewater system is these wastewater retention structures, because as I said, you see one under construction right now around Back Cove. What are they and how do they help? This is the, uh, uh, a, a drawing, a sketch of what's being constructed under the soccer fields over by Back Cove. Um, if you go by there now, you can see big cranes there. So I'm going to show you what they're building and why. This is just a photograph um, from the site for scale. Here's a truck up here. Here's a person down here. So they're just basically they're building a big basement. What happens in Maine basements when it rains? They flood, right? So what the city is building here is a basement so that will flood and by design. And this is just to give you a sense of the scale of this basement that they're building. Um, and how does it work? So now I've got one more, I think one more cartoon here to show you how it works. So the, normally this is how the system works. Sanitary wastewater flows through the sewer system, flows to the East End treatment plant for treatment, and then is, uh, discharge to Casco Bay after treatment. But then it starts raining. When it starts raining, now we have storm water and the sanitary wastewater is pretty constant. We use this, we produce about the same amount of sanitary wastewater every day, but when it's raining, we have that added in. Our sewer system fills up. Eventually, if it keeps raining, if we get too much rain, it fills up until, so we've got more flow to the treatment plant, but even beyond that, if it keeps raining, the system over, essentially starts to overflow what the city is building is like a big bathtub so that when the system fills up, it will spill over into that basement, right, that will flood and fill up with this combined stormwater, sanitary wastewater, because we can treat it. We just don't have, we can't treat it now because there's too much. And so it's like putting it aside and holding it, retaining it until hopefully it doesn't rain too long, it starts, the sun comes out, the system stops filling and starts emptying. And then the retention, the retained water can be then open a valve and send it to the treatment plant for treatment. And so what it's doing is it's 
preventing some of that CSO activity and instead retaining it and it's getting treated just like it would otherwise, but we're just holding on to it until the plant can handle the flow. Um, this is um, just a summary of there are already two of these retention structures in operation. One of them is underneath Baxter Boulevard. It holds about a million gallons. Another one is under Payson Park. This is the one under construction. There's another one that's been designed, hasn't been built yet at Back Cove West. Um, and you can see that the, this one that's being built now is three and a half times as big as the ones that were, each of the ones that was already built. Another, and then some very large ones are planned. They have not be, yet been designed. Um, but the plan is to just each, you know, put them in strategic places and get as much of this CSO water retained so it can be treated um, through the treatment plant. And it's been a great success that the city deserves a lot of credit for. Um, here, this is 20 years ago. This is today. The spikes in this graph, this is showing the total amount of CSO. You add up all the flow through all those CSOs in a year. And um, it was averaging about a billion gallons a year all together, all added together. And now it's down in the 300 million gallons per year overflowing. So they've, they've mitigated 70% through both separation in some cases, but also through these retention structures. So um, it's really a big success story. I will also tell you that the law of diminishing marginal returns definitely applies here, that mitigating the first, say, half of the pollution probably costs as much as the next 10 percent, but costs as much as the next 5 percent. It just gets much more expensive because anytime you're doing any of this work, of course, you're disrupting other infrastructure and there's just it's quite expensive. But uh, I think a lot of credit should be given to the city for what they're doing here. Okay, um, I'm going to keep moving because I want to get you to your dinner. Um, so I'm going to switch gears and I'm going to talk. I'm done talking about the sewer system and now I'm going to switch to the drinking water system. So in the and I'm going to be very simple about this drinking water treatment varies depending on whether you are treating surface water from a lake or a river or groundwater from wells. Um, because we use Sebago Lake um, as our source of drinking water, I'm not going to talk about groundwater treatment. I'm going to talk about surface water treatment because that's what we do. Um, in its very simplest terms, you start with uh, this hypothetical lake and you basically do three things to treat surface water. Um, first thing you do is you filter it because any lake or river, most lakes or rivers are gonna have algae and soil particles floating around in them. So you filter them through a sand filter, a membrane filter. There's lots of different methods to do it, but you remove the particles so that then you can move on to the next step, which is disinfect the water because you're always gonna to wanna to disinfect it. Any lake or river could have pathogens in it. You don't wanna drink that water undisinfected. So after you filter it, you disinfect it and then you're going to add some chemical additives for corrosion control, for example. There are always things you have to add to sort of fix the water, the chemistry of it, so that it can move through the pipes without rusting them out, for example. And then from there, it goes to homes and businesses. So that's like surface water treatment in its simplest description. Now I'm going to pivot a little bit and talk about our source of drinking water, Sebago Lake. This is a beautiful aerial image of Sebago Lake. And I'm going to answer two questions about it. How much water is in that lake? And how clean is it? Uh, and then that will lead to the rest of my talk about water treatment. So I could tell you, and I will tell you now, there's about a trillion gallons of water in that lake. But that number doesn't mean a lot, just in, for me anyway. Like, what does a trillion gallons mean? Maybe this is why I'm not an engineer, because I can't really do much with that number in my head. What does that mean? Can it, so I'm going to try to put it into some context to to illustrate what, what a trillion gallons means. So just imagine those splash trucks that are used to fill swimming pools. So think of that quantity of water. And now here's the thought experiment. Let's take Sebago Lake, we'll attach a spigot to it, and we'll line up a bunch of those trucks and we'll fill them with Sebago Lake water one after another until the lake's empty. So each truck is, say it holds 10,000 gallons, it's about 50 feet long, and we'll just start filling them until the lake is empty. It turns out that if you did that, you could fill 100 million splash trucks before the lake was empty. Okay, well that helps me a little bit, but a trillion gallons is very nebulous. 100 million trucks is a lot of trucks, but I still can't do a lot with that number. Um, that's a lot of trucks. How, 
So how far would the line of trucks reach? Like, would they stretch across greater Portland? Would they stretch across Maine? Would they stretch across the country? It turns out that water trucks filled with Sebago Lake water would stretch from the earth to the moon and back twice. We are the Saudi Arabia of water. We have so much water available to us. It's you, If you ever pick up the paper and it says, drought conditions, Portland is out of water, trust me, it, the whole world is, is without water because we have got... We've got enough water in storage for 100 years. By that, I mean we collectively use 8 billion gallons per year. But we have more than 800 billion gallons in the lake. So that's 100 years worth of water. Now, there are places in California and in the parched west where they probably have a reservoir with a year's worth of water, and it may be two, and they're praying for rain so that they don't run out. We have more than 100 years in storage, so we are incredibly fortunate that we, we've come to the right place. Um, so now I'm going to talk about how clean it is, because having a huge amount of water that was dirty, well, it would be okay because you can treat it and clean it, but having a huge amount of water that's clean would be a lot better. So I'm gonna, I could talk for a whole hour about Sebago Lake water quality, and you'd rather go eat your dinner. So I'm going to move, I'm only going to talk about Sebago Lake water quality with one measure of water quality, turbidity. We all kind of know intuitively what that is. Turbid water is murky and mucky and you wouldn't want to drink it. Water of low turbidity isn't. It's clear. And this NTU just stands for Nephilometric Turbidity Units, which is just the measure that the, the instruments that measure turbidity measure it in these this unit called Nephilometric Turbidity Units. Don't worry about that term. It won't be on your test. Um, but I'll just show you that these three samples of water are of three different turbidities. That one has a turbidity of 500 NTU, and you can see it's murky. You wouldn't drink that. If, you, if that showed up on, in your glass on your table, you'd say, no, thank you. I, would, I don't want to drink it. The one in the middle is 50 NTU, and the one on the left is 5 NTU. So if I put a glass in front of you that was had a turbidity, the water had a turbidity of five NTU, you'd probably drink it. Like it doesn't look murky. The instrument that you, that measures this could tell that there is some particles floating around in there. It's not zero, but you probably, your eyes probably couldn't even see it. So now I'm just going to show you Sebago Lake's turbidity. So this graph, I think this is my only graph. Um, it's, it covers the period of time from 2010 to 2019, so it's 10 years of measurements. We measure turbidity continuously. What I mean is we have instruments online and as the water flows into the plant, it is constantly having its turbidity measured. And I think the way it works is every 15 minutes, a computer says, okay, what was the worst number we saw in the last 15 minutes? What was the murkiest? What was the most turbid water that went past this instrument? And the, it grabs that number. And that's the number it records. Not the best number, but the worst. And then at the end of the day, the program says, what was the worst number we saw all day? And it, that's the number we report. So what you see on this graph, and by the way, the, the red line at the top, that is 5 NTU. So that's and that's the raw water standard. In other words, our raw water, untreated water, lake water, has to always be below five in order for us to um, operate our treatment plant properly and to be in compliance with the regulations. That's Sebago Lake's turbidity over 10 years. That's the worst number we saw every day for 10 years. And it's usually around 0 0.22, 0 0.25. It's less than 10% of the raw water standard, and it doesn't change. This is what's amazing is if you had a river water, like um, Aaron was talking about the Louisville River, he used to live in Louisville, a river is going to have, when it rains, you're going to see a spike of 100, 200 in turbidity. Sebago Lake spikes to 0.3. Like that's a bad day. We say, oh my gosh, what happened? Why is the lake 0.3? It's so stable. And that is just what you want when you're Drink, when you're providing drinking water because you can disinfect it and you don't have to worry about turbidity. Um, Sebago Lake is really miraculous. When we show these numbers to our colleagues in other cities, they just can't believe it, that that is our raw, raw water turbidity. Sebago Lake is so clean that it has what's known as an exemption to filtration, meaning 
other, I told you that um, water treatment, and this is our plant, by the way, um, surface water treatment consists of three components, filter it, disinfect it, and then add chemicals and send it to your customers. We can skip the filtration step. We don't do that step because there's nothing to filter out. That we, We're already at what would be considered a pretty good finished water turbidity, a very good finished water turbidity. To give you a sense of how rare this is, there are about 13,000 surface water suppliers in the United States. So that's 13,000 communities that are using either a lake or a river as their source. Of those 13,000, about 50 of them are exempt from filtration, and we're one of the 50. So we're one of 50 out of 13,000. So we have this huge amount of water, and it's so clean we don't even have to filter it. Trust me when I say we won the lottery when we when we moved to this community, or if you've gr grown up here, this is we are the lottery winner of water supplies. Because, for example, building a filtration plant for Sebago Lake to, to treat 8 billion gallons a year, 22 million gallons a day is 8 billion a year. We estimate it would cost around $150 million to build that plant. Now that's just to build it. That's the built infrastructure. So it'd be nerdy engineers digging the hole and then pouring all the concrete, but then you have to operate it, which costs money as well. So it costs several million dollars a year just to operate it. And that would be just to get all the particles out of the water so that then we could disinfect it as we always have and, and, and add the additives. So having an unfiltered supply means for you that our water is less expensive than it would otherwise be because we've saved right off the bat 150 million in infrastructure costs. It tastes better than it would because filtration, there are chemicals that you add to aid in the, in the filtration process. We don't have to add those. And so our water tastes more like lake water untreated. It's also safer. And I will say that with confidence because think about this. Here's the metaphor I'll give you. If your goal was not to get shot, and most of us have that goal, right? Would you rather that I take a gun with bullets in it and aim them at you and you put on a bulletproof vest and you say, this bulletproof vest is it will protect me from those bullets and I shoot them at you and we hope the vest works and let's say it does, or would you rather you just take all the bullets out of my gun? What is more likely to result in you not getting shot? Well, a lake that has no pollutants in it, we don't have to worry about did the treatment process work well today? Did, it was, it's already, the pollutants aren't in there in the first place. So that is mu much safer for you that we don't even have pollution to be removed. Um, it, it, it's already naturally removed. So why? Like, how did we win this lottery? What did we do? Is it just because we're nice people? Well, it turns out Sebago Lake is so clean it's a combination of nature and nurture, like most things. It's not just one thing. There's several reasons. Some of them are natural and some of them are because of things people have done. In simplest terms, the lake is huge, as I talked about. It's quite deep. It's the deepest lake in New England. It's very cold because this is Maine. This isn't Florida. And the lake and the land around it has been very well cared for. So that's the nurture part. So nature, we were given this unbelievable source to start with. And over the last couple hundred years, people of Maine have taken good care of the land around it. And because of that, we win the source lottery. I'm going to talk now, I'm going back to the watershed because you've seen it before. There's the watershed map. The area that you see colored in yellows and oranges and greens is the watershed of Sebago Lake. It's 235,000 acres of land and 80 to 85% of that land is forested, okay? There's the nurture, okay? So why does that even matter? Well, first of all, here's, a, here's an aerial image. Here's the Naples Causeway right here. This is Long Lake right here. This is Highland Lake in Bridgeton. This is Brandy Pond. Here's Sebago Lake down here. So this is the lakes region. Look at how green and furry that picture is. Sure, you can see Route 302, and there are some businesses along there. There's some fields, but mostly it's green and furry, it's forested. That is why, that's the, the, the nurture that I'm talking about. Because the watershed is so forested, Sebago Lake is so clean. Why? Like, what is the forest doing that's so magical? Well, first of all, the tree canopy itself. So the next time it's raining, go for a walk in the woods and listen. 
So you'll be walking through the woods and you can hear, it sounds like it's drumming, right? You can hear this pitter patter, right? Of all the raindrops hitting the tree canopy above your head. Okay, what, how is that, why does that matter? Well, those raindrops are falling from a mile or two miles above your head and they're screaming down a lot of energy, but they're hitting leaves and those leaves, the sound that you're hearing is the energy that's in that part, in that raindrop being dissipated and being absorbed by the leaf or by the branches. And then the water from there kind of slowly oozes down the branches. And so when it hits the ground, it's going much slower. If the canopy is gone, then all that energy of that raindrop is hitting the earth and it's gonna break up the soil. The soil is gonna erode and it's gonna to flow to the nearest stream and eventually to Sebago Lake in our case. So the tree canopy is like a big cushion that's protecting the earth. Then how about the forest floor itself? It's not hard and flat like a parking lot. It's undulating, it has depressions in it, and it's filled with pine needles and leaves. Leaf litter, we call it, or the duff layer, which is like a big sponge. So not only are these drops, is the energy removed from the drops, but then they kind of flow down, down the trunk of the tree, and then they spread out and they soak into the ground. So the earth, is absorbing all that water instead of it flowing and carrying soil to the nearest stream. So what you could sort of, and this is really a fact, the forests around Sebago Lake are our filtration plant. They are doing the filtering, which is why we don't have to build that. It's happening naturally. So I'm gonna sum up all of what I just said. We have lots of water, it's very clean, and trees are naturally filtering it, filtering it for us while we sleep. Like we don't have to do anything. The trees are doing this for us. So you might say, what's the problem? And, and by the way, this is all good news. There isn't a catch like, oh, this, but this isn't good news. We, we get that so much these days, right? We learn about a vaccine and then we learn, well, it, it may be that you can't get it for a while. Or, but this is all good news. Having lots of water that's very clean and trees are naturally filtering it is all good news. So I don't know if problem is the right word, but there is a challenge that we still face. And, and that challenge is that about 90% of those woods that are doing all that treatment for us are not conserved. What that means is they're privately owned and they could be developed. You know, if you own land, maybe you bought it as an investment so you could later build house lots, you know, sell it as house lots. Well, that if that were to happen, if a lot of those forests get converted into developed land, um, then they won't be able to, the, the trees and the forests won't be able to do all this filtering for us and the lake will decline in quality and that will cost us all money because we'll have to build built infrastructure to do what naturally does, what nature does. So you might ask, okay, Paul, you know, there's a lot of problems in the world today. We read about them every day in the paper. It's almost like we can't take another bit of bad news. Does this even matter? Or is this, can we chalk this up to, okay, this will never happen in my lifetime. And, you know, maybe Sebago Lake is too big to fail. It's the second largest lake in Maine. It's a trillion gallons of water. And I will tell you that you would have to work harder to pollute a trillion gallons of water than you would have to pollute a much smaller lake. So we do have kind of, an advantage in that the lake is very large, it's cold, it's deep, it has natural capacity, um, but is it too big to fail? Okay, so I'm gonna answer that rhetorical question because a trillion gallon lake is pretty big. And so maybe we can kind of put this in the back burner and say, let's not worry about this problem. Well, here are some very big lakes. These are the Great Lakes, of course, you've all seen them. And I'm gonna focus on one of them, that's Lake Erie. Lake Erie is a pretty big lake too. Lake Erie, I'm going to zoom way in on it, and now I'm going to overlay Sebago Lake on Lake Erie so you can get a sense of how big Lake Erie is. There's Sebago Lake at the same scale as Lake Erie. So if you've been to Sebago Lake recently and you, you've got to look at it and say, oh my gosh, this is an enormous lake, it's really just a drop in a huge bucket when you put it next to Lake Erie. So why do I pick Lake Erie? Lake Erie holds 27 trillion gallons of water. So it's 27 Sebago Lakes. This is Lake Erie a few years ago. You may have read about this. This is one of the largest algal blooms you'll see. This is Lake Erie is blooming. And by the way, the city of Toledo over here, their drinking water intake is right in this green area over here. They, you know, you, you might've seen pictures of it. If you haven't, 
Google Toledo drinking water algal bloom, and you won't believe how green this, it looks like, um, it looks like spinach soup. Um, anyway, um, there again, that algal bloom of, of a few years ago is larger than, many times larger than Sebago Lake. Well, there's no big secret to why Lake Erie blooms periodically. Here's the city of Detroit here. Here's the city of Toledo over here. And just look at this picture. I zoomed in on it so you could see how much the natural infrastructure has been disrupted. And this isn't because these are bad people. This is just, there's a lot of people there. And so they've built a lot of roads and a lot of parking lots to, for those, all those people to live. And they've removed so much of the vegetation that the nature can no longer treat the water naturally. Here's Cleveland over here. This is, you know, the city of Cleveland. The trees are, there's not enough trees left to do the job. And so too much, too many nutrients flow to the lake when it rains. And by the way, this up here is Ontario, Canada, and it's very agricultural. And so farms can, if, if not managed properly, can also um, contribute to uh, lake pollution and add nutrients that lead to algal blooms. So if Lake Erie is not too big to fail, then Sebago Lake is not too big to fail. So it is something we should, we should talk about. But the great news is the worst thing in lake protection is when you have to restore a polluted lake and try to bring it back to a, an earlier condition. It's, it's very expensive and it almost, it doesn't even work very well. We are in this enviable position where the lake that we drink from and that many people use for recreation is stunningly clean right now. And so our job is to try to keep it that way. And this image I'm showing you, that is the watershed of Sebago Lake. Just look at it. It looks nothing like the watershed of Lake Erie. It is very forested. It's all these rural communities, and that's where our water is being treated. How can we keep it this way? And the answer is we can, by the way. And and the better and the even better than that is we can and, and realize a lot of other benefits besides just clean drinking water. So I'm going to introduce, I think this is my last term, I'm going to define a partnership. And because I've worked for now 25 years in, in the nonprofit world, the nonprofit water world. And when you are working for a nonprofit organization on natural resource protection, it's really key to work in concert with other organizations that can help you to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. So this is the longest definition I'm going to give you. I know PowerPoint slides with lots of words are not great, but a partnership is two or more organizations with complementary goals. They're not necessarily the same goals, but they're complementary, working together to accomplish more than any one of them could accomplish alone. I'll simplify that and say there's partnership math. One plus one plus one equals five. So three individual organizations by working together in a partnership can accomplish more than any of the three of them could do alone. The partnership to protect Sebago Lakes forests began 20 years ago with a partnership between these three organizations, the Loon Echo Land Trust, the Western Foothills Land Trust, and the Portland Water District. I would love to tell you, it would make a great story for me if I said, and I dreamed this idea up and I said, I know what we can do. Didn't happen that way. Uh, Loon Echo Land Trust came to us and they happened to come to my office and said, we're trying to conserve some forest it's in the Sebago Lake watershed. We're trying to raise money to do that because that's what nonprofit land trusts have to do is raise money so that they can ac accomplish their goals of conserving forests. And they just said, could you give us a donation? Because won't this help, you know, this will help keep Sebago Lake clean. So, you know, they were fundraising. And um, I brought the request to our board of trustees and they agreed, well, that is a good thing. If they can serve that, I think it was about 60 acres, that first deal. If they can serve that, that's going to be good for Sebago Lake, good for our customers so we can justify a contribution. Okay, so that's the beginning of the story around 2000. I was so young and innocent then. Um, so, but I'm going to just make you a timeline to show you what's happened since that first deal back in 2000. Um, by 2007, several other opportunities had come up. Land trusts, one or the other of them had come to us and asked for a contribution. And by 2007, a total of 366 acres of forest had been conserved in the watershed by the district partnering with the land trusts and others. Um, so our board then thought, we should have a policy about this. It shouldn't just be come to us with a request and we'll consider it. 
So by 2012, we conserved 1,600 acres and a program was created, which established a process, an application process and, and funding for this. Um, in 2017, other partners saw what we were doing. We were up to 4,000 acres conserved and other organizations said, we want to help you because what you're doing, we believe in it. We agree. We want to help. Um, this is the Sebago Clean Waters Partnership. There are nine organizations. The first three I already talked about, the Casco Bay Estuary Partnership, the Trust for Public Land, the Highstead Foundation, the Nature Conservancy, the Open Space Institute, and the Lakes Environmental Association. These are all organizations that partnered with us because they saw what we were doing and wanted to help. And they brought resources, expertise, and help that we never could have done without them. The goal being conserving water, wildlife, and way of life in the Sebago Lake watershed. We're now up to 5,930 acres cons conserved to date. And in 2020, we received a grant, a total of $8 million from the US Department of Agriculture to help us to conserve over the next five years, another 10,000 acres. So we'll be up over 16,000 five years from now, thanks to the US Department of Agriculture and the Sebago Clean Waters Partners who've helped make this happen. So this is just, uh, this is a feel, I want you to feel good about this. This is showing you the Sebago Lake watershed and all the shaded parcels. Some of them are gray, some of them are green, and some of them are pink. Those are all conserved land. And what has been conserved since 2000 by the partners is about 5,900 acres. The water district has contributed about $900,000 over that time but the total conserved value of all that land is over 8 million. So that means the other partners have raised over $7 million to make this happen. As I told you, a partnership is one plus one plus one equals five. The Portland Water District could not do this alone. We don't have $8 million to invest in this, but with our partners, we were able to do it. The last point I'll make is that natural infrastructure has many co-benefits. In addition to clean drinking water, it produces all these other things. So you can serve forests and not only do you get clean water naturally, but you get fisheries, you get better, more wildlife habitat, et cetera, and outdoor recreation. So here is my, my dog and I um, at Raymond Community Forest, which is a property conserved by the Loon Echo Land Trust and others with help from the Portland Water District. You can hike on it. This is Sebago Lake in the background. Water from this site is being treated naturally and flowing to Sebago Lake, and yet it's an outdoor recreation paradise. Um, you can learn more about Sebago Clean Waters here at the website, sebagocleanwaters.org. I would love it if you went to that website and learned more about this effort because it is ongoing and will continue really from now on, because this is really conserving water, wildlife, and way of life is, a, is something we, we, that will never sort of end. It's what we'll be doing from now on. And that is my last slide, and I'd be happy to answer the questions that have come in, Jess. Thank you so much, Paul. We see smiling faces in the, in the Zoom images you can't see. Um, uh, yeah, we have a number of great questions uh, after that great presentation. Um, the first was right back at the beginning when you first showed um, the 43, is it a 43 inch pipe? The 41, the 43, 42. And that question was whether iron is a cast iron pipe, is the iron from the pipes going into the water um, and is that a safety concern at all? And mm -hmm. I would just add onto that, what all the parts, whatever materials are used now, should people be, con be concerned about what the water is passing through in our water system? Our water, natural main water in southern Maine especially, is naturally corrosive. That's just a fact. But it's it, we add um, corrosion inhibitors at the treatment plant to avoid concerns about corrosion down the line. So, in other words, the water can move through that pipe and not uh, and not leach metal out of it because of the chemistry of the water when it leaves the treatment plant. Awesome, thanks. And this is a similar style of question, but um, does the wastewater treatment plant remove nitrogen from the wastewater? It does. Um, it doesn't remove all of it, but it removes some of it. And it, um, because the the um, the system itself, it was recently the East End plant was recently renovated, and the new system. Uh, and I'm way out of my element here. There are plenty of people at the district that know way more about this than they've forgotten more about it than I know. But you can now in that aeration system that I showed you, there's a way now to um, 
add air in more in one part of it than the other. And so the, that combination of aeration and then anaerobic uh, activity can remove some of the nitrogen. So it, it's much lower when it leaves in the effluent than when it comes in, in the influent. I don't know off the top of my head what percent is removed, but a significant percent is removed um, because of that new aeration system. Great, and we have a question about whether uh, sea level rise will have an impact on the function of the overflow systems and whether it will be harder for water to flow efficiently downhill if, if I assume maybe if the water table is rising towards it. I mean, that is a concern. I, I, this is way out of my, my expertise, but I, you know, if you notice, you can already see the effects of it because if you ever, on, when there's a lot of rain and it's a high tide, try driving down around marginal way and often it's flooded down there. And so this, I know that there are already engineering ideas in the works for how to protect the system um, from rising sea level. But I, I, I'm, I would be really, I'd make a fool of myself if I tried to tell you the engineering behind it, but it is something that all coastal cities are gonna have to be thinking about. And I know that the city of Portland is looking ahead at that. Um, and, and because we are already seeing some of the effects of, sea, of high, high tides and rain at the same time, and you can see the system backs up into the street. Uh, another question, is there, an, is there an overall group encompassing all of the main water districts? There, is an or, there are two organizations that, one is called the Maine Water Utilities Association and one is called the Maine Rural Water Association. Main Rural Water Association is an association of mostly the smaller water districts around the, this and water companies around the state and Main Water Utilities is more an association of the larger ones. We have a question about, um, you've explained how Sebago Lake is so clean, but a question about whether uh, there is a concern about, you know, gas, you know, boat, you know, boats, pollution from boats. And then what I found really interesting about this question was whether, are there any towns that send their wastewater into Subago Lake, or, or are we kind of balanced to where nothing is going in that you have to worry about? There is no wastewater discharge into Subago Lake or any of the tributaries or any of the lakes upstream. There are septic systems in the watershed and they you know, they naturally treat water through the ground, but it, you know, it's not 100%, but, uh, um, but it, that's the kind, there is no direct discharge. So there is no concern about that. As far as boating goes, um, we monitor at our intakes for gasoline components of of um, boats and things, um, and we have ne we've never detected in our water coming into the plant because our, our intakes are in 85 feet of water, and so like when you see a boat and you can see that sheen, there is certainly gasoline products in in any lake that has boating in it but it mostly wants to go into the atmosphere. That's why it's sitting right on the surface like that. So we're drawing water from 85 feet and we have a 3000 foot uh, diameter, no trespassing zone um, around our intakes. So the boats are far enough away and the, the fuel that they are inevitably comes out of a, uh, the back of a boat is able to get up into the atmosphere such that we've never detected it in our raw water. Thank you. Um, we have some more questions. Here's one. Uh, are the main water districts in general concerned with the commercial extraction of groundwater by private bottled water interests? I don't really know. How, I don't know how to answer that question. Like to how do other utilities feel? I, I mean, I, I don't know. I, you know. I can tell you how I personally feel, but I don't know that that's really what anyone wants to hear anyway. Um, so I don't, I don't, I think it would be best to reach out to say the Maine Water Utilities Association or the Maine Rural Water Association and ask them if there's a position on that or that kind of thing. So we have one that I, I guess is maybe more about uh, wastewater and, and getting water out of those, those overflow situations. And it asks whether pervious paving as opposed to impervious paving um, is a good idea, I guess is a good idea for Portland or for this area as a way of keeping um, uh, rainwater out of the system? I would say, you know, generally my answer to that is yes, because pervious pavement isn't natural infrastructure, but it, it's doing, it's trying to preserve at least one of the functions that natural infrastructure would provide, which is infiltration. And any water that we can prevent from entering the storm system is going to 
mitigate some of the problems. So pervious pavement, if it if it is to the extent that it's able to absorb rainwater or pass rainwater and infiltrate it into the ground, will decrease the pressure on the sewer system. So yes, I think that would be a great thing. Uh, this is a follow up question to something you had talked about earlier. Um, uh, uh, someone's interested in what the corrosion corrosion inhibitors are. Do you know the name? We add, yeah, we add zinc orthophosphate, and we also add a caustic chemical that raises the pH because zinc orthophosphate functions best when the pH is up in the eight range and Sebago Lake water naturally has a pH in the mid sixes. So you have to add a chemical to raise the pH up so that then the corrosion inhibitor is optimized and works well. And it took us years actually to work out the exact, it's like a big chemistry set and you have to figure out because every lake is different, every system is different, the temperatures are different. Um, but, but we've op been optimized now for about 15 years now and we test periodically to demonstrate that our system is still passivated and is not corrosive. And, and we had one more, I think just one more, um, about whether um, whether you all work out into Casco Bay with oceanography groups, um, I guess kind of as a follow-up to whether whatever is getting out there is having an impact, including on, on fisheries. We Portland Water District does not, um, but we are partners, of course, with Friends of Casco Bay. We're partners with the Casco Bay Estuary Partnership and others. Um, we're we don't really have any oceanography experts on our staff. So again, this is what nonprofits do. You don't, you can't do everything, and so you kind of we have a legislatively chartered mission. The legislature said this is what we need you to do. That's where we try to stay and do what we do, and then but partner with other organizations. All of our information is public information and we, um, we seek ways to work with other um, organizations who are doing things that are complementary. but we, we do not have any, we don't do any monitoring in the Bay, others do that. I think that wraps it up. Yeah, thanks everybody for all of those great questions. Yeah, really great questions, really great presentation. Thank you, Paul. Um, for putting together such a great presentation. It was great to see the, um, the illustrations. That was really fun. Thanks. Thank you so much for having me. I, I think you, you, I hope you can tell that I really do love the topic. I'm proud of where I work and the people I work with and the things that we're doing. Uh, and there's lots more to do. So I really love the chance to talk to the public, you know, because that's really, we're a public entity. So I, I really want people to know what your public entity is doing on your behalf. And um, I, you saw my email there, phunt at pwd.org. If you want to send me an email with other questions, I'm happy to, um, I'm happy to try to answer them or get somebody that can. Great. And uh, everyone keep in mind, we're back exactly four weeks from today uh, with window dressers for our next episode in our sustainability series. And I guess we will hopefully see you all then. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Great. Thanks, Paul. Thank you all. Good night.